So I want to welcome you to another episode of Stefan Frank's uh, photo book show. This is number 15. Um, and yeah, most of you know this already. Um, Stefan looks at recent and not so recent photo related books in his show. Um, some that you might know and others that you might not know. And today is uh, the photographer's eye learning photography from books. And um, I want to very quickly tell you about a few upcoming classes. Daura Campos and Samantha Ortega will teach cameraless photography. Um, and in that class, you'll create analog photography art without the need for an analog camera or dark room. Um, if you have questions for Stefan, you can simply unmute and ask. Um, and then at the, at the very end, um, uh, you can definitely ask uh, even more questions. Um, you can also put your questions into the chat. We will read them out uh, later or sometimes we also do that in between. Today's talk will be about an hour long. And, um, and I think that's it. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And I also want to thank uh, Stefan for yet another photo book show. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for having me, Anja. So I'm always delighted to be here and I'm always delighted to see so many people here. Um, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, today will be a little bit a peek uh, in the back room of how I personally construct my courses and what the things, what are the things that drive me to do that. Um, you already see one of the books we were talking about on this screen here. Uh, but before we get to that, let me get you, uh, let me share my screen with you and show you a little bit about what we will be talking about. All right, so the, the, the photographer's eye. Um, this is uh, something that is very personal to me because uh, I will talk about some of the books uh, that uh, where I learned photography from. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to look at uh, to look at photo books. Uh, sometimes it's just the pleasure of looking at how different people see the world in different ways and put this into photographs. Um, but today we will be looking at books that actually try to help you um, develop uh, as a photographer. And this is what Strudel Media is about. This is what my courses are about. But also this is uh, what I'm trying to do for my own photography. So photography is always something where you do not stop. Eventually, you just try to progress uh, from book to book, from project to project. And these are some of the projects uh, from which I learned a lot. So this will be... Uh, this will be about some of the books, maybe some of you already know them, uh, but maybe some of them are new for you. So please, if you have any questions, just jump in and we start right away. So as we are having the, the, the title comes from a book by John Sarkowski. So John Sarkowski, you probably already all know him. He was um, curator at MoMA for photography for um, almost 30 years, from 62 to 91 or 92, I guess. And during this time, he, of course, he looked at a lot of photography and um, this is uh, one of the, the earlier pictures from him when he just was sporting this wonderful mustache in the in 75. This is a picture done by Richard Avedon. Um, Sarkowski was a photographer himself. Uh, this gave him uh, a different view on, on photography, of course, different from um, other curators at that time that came from a, a more from an art historical background. So he was actually, um, he actually knew his trait. He knew how to, to take a photograph. But of course, we know him better as a curator and historian. He wrote some of the, the most important uh, books on Eugenia G um, and made, uh, shaped the way we see 
uh, the photography in the in the 20th century. As I said, this is one of his pictures. He was he's actually a, a pretty pretty good photographer. Um, so he did um, quite a quite a few projects before he came to MoMA. So some of them uh, were shown in MoMA. I think there was recently even a retrospective of his work. So it was actually quite quite good. But of course, we do not know him from this. Um, but we know him from this. So the, the Guardian even um, asked the question: Was John Sarkowski the most influential person in twentieth century uh, photography? And there is actually uh, an argument here to be made for that. The reason for that is, of course, this. So during his tenure at MoMA, he um, curated quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of exhibitions, and an astonishing number of exhibitions that um, actually changed the course of photographic history quite a lot. So I just want to pick some of them. One of the things that you probably all know is, is new documents. This was from 1967. And it's strange to look at this exhibition from our viewpoint when we look at the names Diane Arbus, Lee Friedlander, and Gary Winogren. This was the first time these three were shown together in an exhibition. And it's weird to uh, transport you, you need to transport yourself back to the point when this exhibition was set up and nobody actually knew these names now of course these names are household names in in photography and Zakowski was also very good with with titles so the idea of new documents um this also changed the way we saw uh, we we consider documentary photography because Diane Arbus, Friedlander and Winogrand they not only introduced a new way of looking at the world, they also introduced new people um, to the halls of the MoMA. So it's interesting to look at this um, tiny little exhibition that was just, uh, I think it was just three rooms. So not pretty, not as fancy as you might expect, uh, pretty downgraded. Uh, at that time, photography was not the big thing that it is today, uh, especially not in a in a in a museal context. So a lot of this momentum that photography got in the in the years after that that came from these from these exhibitions. So and this is the way they were hanging together in this in this place here. Um, the, the interesting thing is this was so influential. I just want to point this out. There is uh, new documents 50 years later. There's a really cute uh, YouTube, uh, really cute video on YouTube uh, where some of the people that you see in the pictures here that were shot at the, the vernissage of this show, uh, they actually come back on stage and it's almost like a, like a school reunion there. But they are talking about a, a very influential moment in, in photographic history and um, are able to transport you a little bit back to this tumultuous revolutionary moment that uh, was this uh, that actually was this ex exhibition. Um, he was also all his life he was dealing with uh, Eugène G. He um, recovered him a little bit from the obscurity that he was falling into again. So the first serialist dragged him out of the the abyss of photography and then Sarkowski with this great retrospective exhibition did it again so he also wrote a couple of um couple of books so maybe we do one photo book show later that only has uh, the books of John Sarkowski and Jena J it was certainly worth its own it's only its own photo book show he also did this so this was uh photographs by Stephen Shaw so he was involved in that he not curated it directly, but yes, he was leading the program at that time. He was responsible for this for this show. This was uh, the first color photographs of uh, Stephen Shaw that were shown in, in the MoMA. And that was still a moment when color photography was not a thing, in, especially not in a museum context, which you can see from uh, from another uh, from another show that he created, William Eggleston Guide, that was shortly before, that was 
so new at that time to actually show color photographs in a museal context uh, that the official photographer who from the MoMA who was responsible for documenting all the exhibitions, he actually shot everything in black and white. So these are the, the official, um, the official uh, exhibition documents from the MoMA, but they lose, of course, all the color information there that you see from, from William Agatson there. So Zakowski was very pivotal in, in shaping this idea that you can actually show color photographic it's in a in a museal context and it's not only for advertising but it's actually for for photographs that you might want to look at in another context um one of the the shows that he curated was actually the photographer's eye this was uh zakowski was um very elaborate, was very uh, knowledgeable in the history of photography of the 20th century and also of the the, uh, the late 19th century. So this was a show that he created um, to show different aspects of photography and he used exemplary uh, photographs from throughout his, his whole career as a curator to um, to talk about these aspects of photography. And this is actually the uh, exhibition that eventually turned into the one of the books that we were talking about. Um, and this is how it looked. So uh, he was also one of the first who championed this idea of a very loose hanging in, in the MoMA with big prints and small prints and bringing all this together. So it was very, uh, good at combining uh, photographers, different aspects from different times, different aspects, and putting them together in this way. Um, the this quote is interesting. This is from from the introduction of photographers. I this uh, explains a little bit how Sarkowski, um was conceptualizing photography so for him photography is less a journey than a gross its movement has not been linear and consecutive but centrifugal photography in our understanding of it has spread from the center it has by infusion penetrated our consciousness like an organism photography was born whole it is in our progressive discovery of it that its history lies I find it really interesting too that his concept is very is very organic. It's not like a, it, it's not um, artistic, hierarchical in a way. It's very close to okay. This is how photography works. It works like an organism. Um, the longer quote that we started with uh, the quote that we started with is, is actually from a work on, on Gina G, uh, where he explained that. Um, photography is basically a, um, a way of pointing. It's the, it's the art of pointing. Uh, of course, this, um, uh, this quote is part of a larger quote. Um, but if you look at it like this, you should think, yeah, pointing. Yeah, that should be easy, right? So, um, but if you look at the long version of this, this is a long version of it. And the long version says, OK, this is actually the, the art of pointing, the art of uh, showing other people, hey, look at that. That might be interesting for you to look at. Uh, this is actually something that involves, uh, that elevates the, the act of pointing to a creative plane. What an interesting idea that you can walk through the city and point to things. And this is a actually a creative act and not only an act where you just show people the way. Um, it has aspects that would be beautiful, humorous, morally instructive, cleverly ordered, mysteriously or astonishing. All the things that we identify with, with photography, this is where the fun in photography comes from, that photograph can all can be all this and this is when you remember when you walk through the street this is how pointing works look at that isn't that funny but it, of course he also thinks that this art of pointing is a new discipline this is different from uh this differentiates it from from uh from painting it's a new discipline this art of pointing um 
interestingly enough, you need a special grace. And this is when you look at the work of Sarkowski as a curator. He was also always looking for that a certain grace that you see in this uh, in the photographs that he picks out. Um, it requires a sense of timing. Uh, famously, um, Cartier-Bresson talked about the decisive moment. So you have to have a sense of timing to, to photograph and to point to something uh, when something is actually happening. It has a narrative sweep. Um, but also, and this is important for uh, Sarkowski's conceptualization of photography, it requires intelligence. Uh, you are usually not done with just snapshotting away. You have to be, uh, all his work is about thinking about photography and it requires a certain form of rigor to organize this pointing act. And in the end, this act of pointing is a work of art. And when you take it like that, and when you listen to and read through this longer um, part, we all know that this just simple, very simple pointing act, it's maybe not as simple as it starts out to be. So actually the question is how to point and for us, of course, it's a question how to photograph, how to develop as a photographer, how to, for Sarkowski, it was the idea how to develop criteria to determine, is it a working photograph? Is it a photograph that people might want to look at? Is it, is it an important photograph? So for us, it's, it's about how to develop uh, as a photographer. And basically how to learn photography and this is of course it is beyond there's a lot of stuff that you can learn in photography starting from how to i how to i um operate my camera but of course it doesn't stop there so what when you know how to operate a, your camera what's what's next what's coming next and apart from doing it actually doing it, actually walking through the street and pointing at stuff with your camera. What are the ways that you can learn photography? And I um, have been thinking about these, these ideas for, for quite some time now. A lot of this thinking goes into the courses, but of, of course, a lot of this thinking goes into my own development, into the development of my own projects. And I sometimes think uh, that most so this is the reason why I was looking at the the um the way that we teach photography and the way that we learn photography. And very often, more often than I would like to admit, um, we are as teachers, we often refer to learning through analogy. So this is so this equals that. That can be very funny, that can be very simple. Uh, but very often we do it like this. So we look at some pictures from a, from a photographer we newly meet. And then we have in, our, in the back of our minds, because we all have been looking at so many photographers, we say, yeah, you're photographing empty parking lots. Please look at Stephen Shaw. Uh, you're interested in uh, the class system. Uh, please look at Chris Killip. You're interested in Germany. Yeah, look at Michael Schmidt. And I often think this is learning through analogy, learning at other, other photographers' pictures. This uh, has some issues at times. So very often it is, uh, we are not doing the photographers we advise in this way, a, a disservice because we don't know them very well. We don't know their background very well. So pointing them into a certain direction may just be misleading, but we also, might do the photographers we uh, we point to uh, a disservice because more often than not you uh, at least this is my experience from me looking at photographs uh, very often I look at photographs and I have not the slightest idea what's happening in this photograph or why should I look at this photograph or why is this photograph interesting so a lot of this learning by analogy might fall short because of an inability to actually see what's going on in the picture. So 
this might simplify this to you travel through America and take snapshot pictures, look at oh, Frank. So this might simplify things to a level where no one will be really happy with this with this advice and really really will get something out of this. And this is actually the point where the, the courses at Shulu Media jump in, at, but also the these books jump in. They jump in at the point. Here's a picture. Uh, this is something that you might want to look at in this picture. So basically, it is all about. So these all these books are basically about how to see, how to look at, how to look at images. And with this being said, let's jump into the first one. Okay. So let, let's jump right in. So this is. This is a, a, the book I already mentioned. This is from a um, uh, from an exhibition Sarkowski did, um, and this sums up pretty neatly his his philosophy of uh, of photography. It has this structure of uh, talking about the thing itself, the detail, the frame, time, vantage point. So already right off the bat, he groups pictures by um, from different photographers by uh, advising to look at these pictures from a certain point of view. Look at them, for example, as the thing itself. So this is here, um, has a long introduction here. Interesting read to that explains his, his philosophy. Um, the book itself contains um, a whole lot of um, 20th and partly 19th century photographic history. So all the big names are in here, uh, like this Walker Evans shot that you see here on top, Dorothea Lang, um, Lee Friedlander. So pretty much everybody you expect, um, you will find in here. So this is another aspect of this book. So if you want to get a good introduction on into 20th century uh, photography. This is a good book to do that, to give you that. Um, but I think the interesting thing about this is his groupings into this, this idea that very often uh, it is just very important what you see on the picture. So it doesn't matter how it's, how it's structured. So the thing itself that you're looking at is interestingly enough, and sometimes it's your uh, it's your duty as a photographer just to step back and say, I'm just doing my job here just to document what I see right in front of me. And this is why the thing itself groups a lot of these pictures where the people that you see in the pictures are um, some uh, people are just very important. Like here, this picture from uh, of Ezra Pound that uh, Richard Avedon did. So, um, but sometimes it's uh, he has these pictures of photographers that are lesser known, like Russell Lee or Maxime Ducamp. Haven't heard of them before. Uh, before I picked up this book, sometimes he has pictures of photographic royalty, like Richard Avon and, and Robert Frank. Um, so this gives you a good um, overview of um, of history, of, but brings you some pictures that you might not know before. Um, interestingly enough, uh, sometimes even this book falls short. So this is uh, the picture, a picture of Matthew Brady uh, of Conspirator Pain. Uh, if you do not know the history, you might not understand this picture. And that sometimes this is just lacking here. So a lot of it, and a lot of times, uh, Sarkowski relies really on the uh, on the viewer to know a lot about actual history. So uh, Conspirator Pain was, uh, this was a shot that was um, done uh, shortly before it was executed because he made an attack, um, he made an assassination onto uh, a congressman. So that photograph became pretty famous because this showed um, I said, I think it was William Payne uh, shortly before he was killed. So he know he was killed, he will be killed. And it's a strange twist that we know um, 
of course, because it was taken in 1865, that he is already dead. But the weird thing about him, this picture, is that he already uh, that he also knows that he will be dead in a in a few days or in a few hours, actually. But all of this history is lacking here. So it's really he really relies on. Yeah, you have to know the pictures, and the pictures are important here. Um, let's jump into the into the other chapters here. So this is another thing. Uh, this is an interesting essay he sometimes has at the beginning of the, the chapters. He had this, uh, he has this short uh, introductions here that makes things a lot clearer. This is actually um, a scene from uh, the Civil War. So what you can see here, we have to move in here a little closer. What you see here are uh, cannonballs. These are the tiny little things here. And the cannonballs that were fired between a uh, in a fight between the south, uh, um, the south and the the, uh, the north of America in, in civil war. So, but in order to to really decode this kind of image, you also need this kind of uh, information here. And the interesting thing here is just to say, yeah, sometimes pictures work like this. Um, they get their power from tiny little details in the picture. And it continues like this, going through some of the, um, some Civil War pictures, but uh, eventually ends up as one of his favorite at one of his Eugenia G pictures. And it continues. And this is an interesting way to, to look at pictures from, from different people and see that they have some commonality. So here is an interesting spread that focuses on hands, on gestures, and how uh, expressive gestures are. And this is something that when I started out with photography, this was I found this really a revelation here to see, okay, this is how other photographers work. This is how they see the world. This is when we come back to the art of pointing, this is what they point to. Sometimes they point to larger pictures. Sometimes they point to these tiny little details in an image. Also has some funny moments in here. Like, of course, Gary Vinogrand uh, from his zoo series. Um, and so he goes on. So this is the detail. So the next thing here. Is still the next thing is eating. the next thing here is the frame, and again, this is something where you think, okay, it makes a lot of sense that a curator tells you, okay, this is how I look at images, and this is how photographers look at images. They consider that. Uh, a photograph is something that has a frame that is edges and the edges of an image are important. It is important where a picture starts and where a picture ends. And this is the basic decision of photography. What's in, what's out, uh, where is the frame located? And it shows you these motives going through different images, different, different styles of photography is different situations, um, gives you this um, different approaches here, like cutting off in the middle, which is something that you would not normally do because everybody else says you, uh, you do not cut off things in the middle. Here is an example where this actually works. And this is the way this, this book is structured, that he goes on to time. Time is one, of course, one of the important elements of photography starts with a shot from Edward Mybridge was fascinated by this time series uh, to study to actually study the movement of uh, of animals but also of humans so then again he goes through different approaches on how you handle time in a in a photograph and this is something that really 
gives you a lot of ideas, gives you a lot of examples, gives you a lot of um, things to, to think about. So, yeah, time is actually the last one. No, time is not the last one. The last one is the vantage point. This is what he ends with. And again, this is when you pick, when I picked up my camera initially, the, the usual way is that you hold the camera in a way that is natural to walking over the street. Um, but here he groups images that say, yeah, it's not, you can be right. You can just move your camera to another to another vantage point. And this is just something where you just need a lot of examples from different photographers, different approaches, different styles to actually appreciate that and get some ideas on, okay, what, what could be working for me? So this is certainly one of the canon books of photography um, on, on how to learn photography. So for me, this was this was super influential and I always pick it up when I feel stale and look for, for things to change. Let's get to the to the next one here. So the next one is this is this is Stephen Shaw. So um already mentioned Stephen Shaw because of course Sarkowski was making had made uh, Stephen Shaw famous when he was just this guy hanging around in the Andy Ward's factory and making snapshots of everybody and annoying everybody. Um, so this is solving pictures. Solving pictures is has a different structure. It is has an interesting structure. It's structured like an encyclopedia. So it's structured from from A to Z. And the interesting thing about this is. In contrast to this one that groups um, photographs by many different photographers, this groups um, topics of the career of Stephen Shaw. So for every uh, letter in the alphabet, you pick uh, you pick a different topic in his in his career, and this is very this is very interesting approach because now you see you'll probably see here. This is a sick book because Stephen Shaw has a long, long career and he did a lot of um, different stuff. And it's interesting to group this together under this idea um, under different aspects. So here we have, we're still in A here, so American Surfaces. This is one of the um, major projects of Stephen Shaw. So this gives you an introductory idea of how American Surfaces was constructed. Um, Sometimes this book has uh, a lot of images, majorly, um, uh, mostly on the larger projects like Uncommon Places and this um, American Surfaces. And this has the added benefit apart from, okay, this is how Stephen Shaw came up with American Surfaces and these are the pictures of it. This gives you a good introduction to, to the project. Uh, it has a really good selection of, of the images in, in American services. So this gives you an idea of if you want to have, if you want to buy the book that could be interesting for you here, this is a good, a good start, good starting point. So this is one way that he, he structures it. The other way is picking out certain topics in there. So of course, for Stephen Shaw, architecture is majorly important uh, because he, uh, a lot of the time, he just stands on the streets and photographs buildings. This is just part of what he does. So here, this uh, explains a little bit about, okay, this is his interest, where his interest from, from architecture came from and how it, changed throughout the course of his career, how it changed slightly, how it morphed into different things, how he was interested in different things in different projects. And actually architecture is somewhat like a red thread that, that goes through all of this. So 
it has some some weirder aspects of his career like uh Stephen Shaw was on Instagram for quite a while so he had this larger project where he posted one Instagram picture a day and even this weirder project this weirder interests are in fascinating because he had a really long career and uh it's fascinating to see how he changed as a photographer and how he reacted to new developments um, of course, when he started out in the 70s, no one was even imagining that something like uh, the internet would eventually emerge, much less that the selfie generation would end up in Instagram. So it's interesting that he picked this, picked up this idea and tried to work it and try to post something every day. And it's just funny to see what he would have picked out there. Um, Coming back to this idea, what can you, how can you use it to learn something? Um, sometimes it has these single picture analyt uh, analytics here. So this is from Merced River. This is uh, from his Uncommon Places. Um, this is a very, very detailed analysis of this picture that you see here. And this is interesting because if you do not have this analysis and you just look at it, it's interesting to just to look at the picture first then read the text afterwards and see, did I see everything? Or was there an aspect that I missed somehow? Um, the good in this, the good thing about this book is the book is big enough, hefty enough that you get quite decent reproductions of the images. It certainly makes a lot of sense to get it this way, get the uh, essay here and the, the picture there. This is different from seeing the picture just inside the work, like in Uncommon Places, where you just see it appearing in a sequence of uh, together with other pictures and without any analysis to it. So this gives you a different view on, on, some, of his, uh, on, on some of his pictures. But as I already mentioned, uh, it has, uh, for the big project, like Uncommon Places here, it has almost all the images in here, which is also interesting because he's talking about uh, okay, this is how it came about, this is how it went through, this is um, this is what I did. This is interesting when when looking at photographs in this way, because Stephen Shaw actually tells you these things. A lot of photographers just tell you, just look at the images. And the images tell you the story. He's uh, Stephen Shaw is very, very vocal about his, his pictures and about his approach. And coming back to the idea of why is it called solving pictures? So this is, the title comes from the, the initial, uh, from the introduction here and it, there he says, for him, um, every situation poses some kind of a, an almost mathematical equation. So you have to um, balance every element in the in the picture to make sure that you eventually solved uh, the picture and here it is interesting that you have a lot um, almost unknown picture of him and eventually you see that there is a, some kind of tiny thing here in the left upper corner let me zoom you in here and i would Yes, that this is a thing that made his equation eventually work here. So again, this kind of philosophy, this kind of background information, this is super interesting to get from a photographer who had really done a lot of these kinds of um, project has different approaches there. Um, as I mentioned, when he started out, uh, he started out in Andy Ward's factory. So it makes a lot of sense that you get an entry for W, uh, for Andy, uh, for Warhol Andy under W, uh, where he talks about his time at the at the factory uh, where he met Andy Warhol and how it was to be there at that time at, at this place uh, in a certain point in history. So you can also get some of these kinds of, of anecdotes of this is um, okay. 
Let me jump to the last part here. So the, the last part, this is what I find super interesting because uh, a lot of uh, teaching in photography says, uh, okay, the camera doesn't matter. A good photographer can make a photograph with any every camera. And um, I am always super curious to find out, okay, this photo, which kind of camera, which kind of gear did he use? And for... Stephen Shaw, this is super important. It is super important for him to know this is uh, the Rolleiser 35. And this is a picture I took with a Rolleiser 35, which is a camera that is about this big and you can twist it around. Or I did it with a Dorfman, which is a view large view camera that you really have to schlep around the, uh, the buildings. So what he did was writing down for every picture that he ever did in his life, he always wrote down, okay, this is a camera that I used. And as so many photographers say, yeah, this is, it doesn't have to interest you what camera I use. Uh, this is something that I find super, uh, that I was really happy about that he was so open about this. And now you can make up your, your own mind how the camera changed his approach to his photography, which things did the same because he always managed to get some kind of great photograph out of every camera that he's using, but it also changed the camera that he was using. Um, and as I mentioned, we're always still, I'm always still referring to the photographer's eye. So this is really still the, the, the gold standard here. Um, sometimes, I'm missing something here. I'm missing a little bit more information about the images. So Sarkowski is a little bit sparse here. Uh, this is why I want to show you this David Campany on photographs. Um, David Campany, um, British um, writer, curator, art critic, uh, photographic critic, uh, wrote a lot of books. Curiously enough, this also came out with Thames and Hudson. Um, and this book goes um, back to an encounter that he had with Susan Sontag, who wrote this book uh, on photography. Um, and Susan Sontag eventually told him, eventually you will write a book uh, on photographs. And this is where the title comes from. At least this is the anecdote that he's telling when he's uh, always talking, when he's talking about this book. So again, this is, these are pictures that are very dear to to David Campany. So you see when you flip through these these um, these essays here, um, you see the curator behind this. So you see his interest emerging. Although he's collecting here uh, photographs from very different um, viewpoints, from very different photographers, sometimes from photographs of very important um, famous. Uh, had a long career, sometimes just snapshots uh, where you don't know the photographer even. Um, he used a very straightforward format here. It's always one picture on the right and an essay on the left. So this is how the whole um, book is structured. So, and this makes a lot of sense. So Robert Cumming uh, is a conceptual photographer. So when you look at that, you probably don't have an idea of what you actually see in the image. So just giving you the image without the text uh, sometimes falls a little bit short. Um, I'm just adding this here because it's a great book. Uh, the essays are beautiful. They are really enjoyable. Oh, they are really well written. Um, I would exclude it from the idea of learning to photograph because he's, uh, I do not know if this kind of theoretical analysis of an image really helps you to become a better photographer. It certainly helps you to um, understand the implications of what you see here, but it's not like you get a cooking re recipe from him. Um, and this is supported by the idea that he's also um, 
adding here photographers, unknown photographers. It just snapped certain moment that was interesting for them at that moment. And that just gained more significance the further it went. Um, it's interesting to the, the way he collects here. He has, uh, I really appreciate that he tries to manage, although photographic history doesn't make it easy for, for us, he tries to get an even distribution of male and female photographers. So you find a lot of um, photographers from women, which are notoriously underrepresented in histories of photography, not necessarily in actual photography, just in the written histories here. So he has always this viewpoint on how photography changed over time. Um, lots of moments of photographic history like this uh, jump into the into the emptiness by by Eve Klein um, this important moment at the beginning of the movement of the suffragettes um, he's also he has also a very broad concept of photography so he's including film stills here so for him this is also part of what he considers photography. You always you get a lot of famous photographers, but sometimes you get lesser known pictures of famous photographers, like this one from Bill Brandt, which is very, um, which is which I think is really great. Uh, but it is a totally different aspect of Bill Brandt of, uh, of the pictures you otherwise see them in history books. He has this super. Um, emotional moments. This is one of the moments where I almost uh, always end up in tears when I read the text here, because this is uh, what you see here are the lips of Frida Kahlo. Uh, she sent a postcard um, to uh, to Diego Rivera, and she signed it with uh, with her lipstick. So it's always. Uh, always cracks me up when I when I read this essay. So it had David Cameron is really a good good writer in this in this way and brings out this this kind of um things that you see in here. He also, as I already mentioned, he tries to include other things that are not part of the the usual canon of photographic history, like uh this shot from Lela Asaidi. Um Photography from uh, Africa, from Northern Africa, and from Central Africa is chronically underrepresented in photographic history. And this book has a lot of layers. So you think it's just a random collection of uh, essays, but it's not. It's actually carefully sequenced. So here you see uh, Jacques André Boffard important picture of surrealism. And on the next page, you get the other important surrealist with Paul Nogy. So there are different straits that go through here. Sometimes you have pictures that you absolutely cannot understand without the essay here. This is from Bloomberg and Shannarin. And you absolutely have to read the essay or read some kind of text to actually understand what you are looking here at. And as I mentioned, this is carefully sequenced. So sometimes a sequence has a uh, has a content part, and sometimes it has a visual part, like linking this um, this, this cyanotype with a picture of laces. So it works on very many similar, very many different levels here. So, as I said, this will probably not make you a better photographer because there's no recipes in here and but this will make you appreciate photography um again and new and in a different way um so let's get back to to one of the things that uh, to to learning photography so this is actually one of the few books that i could find on um, another topic on understanding photo books, there is a surprising few number of books that actually teach deeper parts of photography, at least that I could find. So 
please, if you know anything else, I'm, I'm always happy to learn something new. But this is from uh, your callback. This is already, um, let me look at it. This is already from 2017. Uh, your callback is a uh, photographic critic. Uh, he comes from, from Germany, uh, but lived in, um, lived in the US for quite a while. Uh, he has this, um, uh, this photo blog, which is quite famous, uh, Conscientious Photo Mac. So that has become quite famous. So there he is reading on photo books. And a lot of this, um, his critics of photo books uh, went into this, into this book here. He's also consulting on making photo books. So this, uh, all his, all this knowledge has been poured into this book. Um, the interesting part about this is he walks you through, okay, this are, these are the steps that you need to go through to have something like this in your hand in the end, to have actually a photo book in your hand in the end. Yes. And uh, I found surprisingly few books that teach you that in that way. Um, so he's using uh, some, so core of this are the, the, the steps that you have to go through and the other steps are, uh, the other core are case studies on that. So he has this uh, one book by Laia Abril, the epilogue, one of her earlier books. Um, and he just goes through these books and shows you, okay, these are, this is how this was crafted and even, the interesting thing about this is that he revisits these photo books um, at different stages. So when you look at the, the contact here, um, he talks about publishing in marketplace, um, from pictures to book, general considerations, editing and sequencing, photo book design, production, and how to make a photo book in 17 rules. Um, that has this has a lot of text because it covers a lot of ground. Um, but this is, as far as I know, one of the few books that actually do cover this ground. Uh, one point of critique that I might add, it is at times a little bit chatty. So he has a lot of content that he wants to get across. And I would sum times have wished that he would structure this content uh, a little bit more terse, a little bit more compact. So a little bit more editing and sequencing, not to um, not to the images, but to the actual text in here would have done good. But I do not want to blame uh, your callback for this because I think he suffers like with all uh, these non-fiction books, I think it's more a problem of uh, editing that you do not have a proper editor to work with you with the text. And sometimes I feel I just you just feel overwhelmed with the amount of um, with the amount of information that he wants to give you. Uh, I also want to point out for um, a book that is about understanding photo books and teaching about design. It is not a really nice photo book. It's not a really nice book. So sometimes you have text like this, which is white on a light gray. It's not really good to read. It's not a really proper layout. But again, no, nothing against your callback. This is probably um, due to the um, to the editor and the publisher here. Um, Really is super interesting here is that you see what you usually do not see when you open up a photo book, you see actual working dummies here. He proposes the idea that you use an old calendar to make your first dummy and just glue your photos in here. And here he uses uh, one of the projects that he's focusing on to, to show you, yeah, this is how this could work. This is how this actually looks in the in the early stages of the photo book. And as far as I know, I've never seen that in a book and I've never seen that you could do that. And I learned that from, from this here. As I said, he moves these photos, his, his case studies, the, the different stages through different design decision talks about, okay, what can you do in terms of design? 
This is Donald Weber Interrogation. This is uh, the book from which you saw the dummy earlier. This is how it eventually ended up. So here it talks about, yeah, this was the, these are the actual design decisions that went in, into this book. So, This is a great book. Has some some flaws, of course, but as it is pretty much alone standing, uh, I think it's still still worthwhile here. And this is the 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 official selection for today. And I just want to because everybody knows this already. Oops. I uh, just want to talk about this. I uh, just want to briefly mention the Photographer's Playbook. If you do not know that, uh, you should buy it. Um, if you get an assignment by one of the teachers, especially by me, uh, a lot of these assignments, I have to admit it here, are stolen from here. So this has um, prompts for um, getting you into photography. And it's just an interesting read it you can just flip through it you cannot just read it on uh from top to bottom but whenever you get bored and you don't know what to do you just pick an assignment from here and get out and shoot something great book to great book to have and i always pick it out when i'm in a rut and i uh, find something new here every time you did it thank you so much um wow i feel definitely that i want to get the David Campany book. I don't have it. So that sounds definitely very interesting. You inspired me to flip yeah. through that one yeah. for this, sure. This Campany book, this is, I think is a must. This is a must. So it's really, it's, it's not only well written, it's also well produced. So it's really, it's again, again, it's one of these books that you do not read from top to bottom. But ever, whenever you think, I, I want to drop my camera for good, I do not know what to do next. You can pick it up. It's very reinvigorating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does, does anybody have any questions or comments for Stefan before we sign off? Okay. Well then, Stefan, thank you so much once again. You know, uh, um, actually, yeah, I was Edward. just going to say, uh, Stefan, um, I recently got the uh, your Kohlberg uh, book and when flipping through it I thought this is impossible you can't even read this thing because <laughs> there, there are these long portions of white text on light gray background and I was like they must be kidding uh, <laughs> and I thought wow for a book on design on book design it, it really <laughs> I thought goodness gracious but who knows that is but, really I'm, I'm I really feel sorry for that because it's it's yeah this is uh, the the text that you mentioned yeah you that it's it's just I think it's a publisher so I yeah. think the, the same is true for the text so sometimes you feel the text says uh, you see him okay I want to get that out and I want to get that out and there's another idea and I want to talk about that so this this unevenness in editing is. Mm. not only for the design but it's also for the for the text so that is of obviously flaw here but that is there is so much stuff in here that you can't find anywhere else that i'd really hope he, we get a second edition that where actually yeah. somebody yeah does a proper design on that and really does some some editing on the text here well it is pretty unusual uh material you know what do yeah, you mean by course. that? Uh, I mean that there aren't really books on how to make a photo book. Oh, um, I see. It's rare. Uh, yeah. And this is probably what why, why the publisher decided, ah, oh, yeah, we won't spend so much time and so much effort on it. And so he probably just mailed the PDF and then it went into InDesign. And it's, yeah. Cool. The, this is what it, what it got us. Shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be done that way. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Okay, Any anybody else? I just want to thank Stefan once again for a love. It's very informative. I'm glad, glad I'm joining in, quite frankly. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for coming. Thanks, All right, thank you, everybody. Oh, and, we um... have a question from Ash. 
Yeah. Um, I had a question. Uh, yes. So, in uh, the Ash, photographer, uh, likewise, Stefan, uh, I had a question regarding the photographer's eye book. Uh, you had said that uh, in some pictures, uh, in some pairings, you you found them weak and uh, uh, and like for example, you needed external context. So uh -huh. I wanted to ask, uh, how how could you, how were you able to come to that conclusion that the pairing was weak? Uh, so uh, from my point, I would think that uh, maybe I don't know, maybe I should try harder to read this picture, or I'm just not getting it. But uh -huh. like, how is someone able to come to a conclusion that this is bad? Um. I think they so there are, there are two points here. So the, the one thing is, um, I I just know this picture, and I know that there was a time when I did not know the history of this picture. So and I'm pretty sure that and of course Sarkowski knows the the picture in here, and he put it into he put it into this the thing itself, and. A lot of these pictures in the thing itself, they rely on a lot of external knowledge. So, for example, here you have to know uh, conspirator pain. You have to know the the history behind that. If you don't know that, yeah, it's a it's a man in shackles. So you don't get this this point. Yeah, he knows. Uh, he looks at us, and he will be dead in an hour. And the basic assumption of a photograph is um, eventually the picture, uh, the, all the people in the pictures, they all will all be dead. So this is the basic assumption of a photograph. And this is a rare occasion where someone who has photographed was also uh, has a different perspective on that. And that really is something that pulls the rug under you if you know that. And if you don't know that, then you just see, okay, it's just a man in shackles. And Zakowski knows it, but he chooses not to share it. And this is what I think, yeah, if you compare it directly with, with this David Campany pictures, a lot of these pictures work like that. So here you know, okay, it's a pissoir, you know it. And here's the here's a background for this, and this gives the picture a different level. And this is something. If if I only know if I only know this picture, if I only know this book, I would probably think, yeah, it's okay. But when you know these kinds of books, and you say, yeah, maybe something is missing here. Although you know, I could imagine, if you don't mind me uh, popping in, uh, that there could. One could say something that, well, the image should speak for itself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that could be a, like, for example, um, the uh, the Frick Museum in New York uh, had to relocate while they were renovating their space. And they relocated into this, uh, the former Whitney Museum. And uh, one of the interesting things that they did was that... Uh, they hung all the work, but there were no uh, there was no signage at all indicating who mm -hmm. painted anything, a title, yeah. a year, or anything like that, because they thought we don't want people to be distracted by this and to stand there reading. We want them to look, which I found really fascinating, and mm -hmm. uh, it was, took a little while to adjust to, but it was quite nice to uh, to just have uh, the image, you know. Yeah, anyway. that, that's, a, that, that's a good point so sometimes you just overwhelm people with yeah here is here is the interpretation for it this this is what you have to think about the image yeah with and that robs people of their their own approach to the image mm -hmm. yeah you're, you're right with that i mean I, I think there are these two different ways of thinking about it. one could think well if you have to read something about an image to enjoy it maybe there's a problem with the image on the other hand uh, you can see images that are enriched uh, by having information about them, you know. But... 
Let me let me give you an extreme example of that. What do you make of this image? Well, you know, abstract oh. something. I can't really see it that clearly. Yeah, no. <laughs> it looks like a painting, I think. Yeah, and the the, the story behind this is Bloomberg and Shannarin. Uh, they were. Uh, war photographers in Afghanistan. So there were the first wave of photographers, uh, the, the, the first wave of embedded photographers. So you have to be vetted as a war photographer. Uh, then all your photographs that you want to publish will be, um, have to be, have to get an allowance by the military. Otherwise you can't publish. So, and their way of protesting this was they brought an undeveloped, uh, an unexposed roll of color uh, photograph film. And they um, put it, they, they cut for every event that they had in the war, that they met in the war as an embedded war journalist. Uh, they cut uh, a slice of this film and rolled it up and put it in a box and wrote the event onto it. And this was the day, uh, the day nobody died. And what you see on the what you see here is just the the smudges of this transporting process of this. I roll it up, I put it in the in the other box, and there's some light leakage here. Hmm. Interesting. And this is what you see what what you find here in the in the essay. And of course, it's a, it's conceptual photography. It's um, they are protesting against the censorship. Uh, of, of photographs there and this is a visual way of um, this is a visual way of making a comment on on this kind of of embedded situation of war journ of journalists in in the war so yeah it's probably both sometimes you need this you need some some explanation some background for that sometimes the background may also overwhelm you yeah yeah Okay, yeah, I mean, definitely it depends on what the book is about and what the whole project is, right? I mean, we do want to know who the guy in shackles is. I didn't know it for years and I always thought, what a beautiful photograph. And then when I knew, I was thinking, wow, I look at it in a very different way now. So mm -hmm. it's good and to I, have that context available. I have a comment to make. Um, so a um, uh, Long time ago, I used to work in my son's school library as a volunteer. And one of the perks was uh, reading all the books that came in from publishers that were kind of rejects, um, first uh, copies that they hadn't really wanted to um, put out. But the library took them in and I got to read them. One of them was a, f a, a work of fiction, total fiction, but the best bit of it was the photographs that went with the fiction. They were put in to completely complement the storyline. And these were photos actually taken by the author, not at the time to uh, put into the book, but happened to be around. And so they were selected as part of the book. And I think I would not have enjoyed the book as much without the photos. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, I think that was a very creative way of putting across a book of fiction and enhancing the kind of way you look at things. Because I think by looking at the photo a lot more, mm. I thought I understood the plot a lot more uh, rather than the other way around. Yeah, that, that is a fascinating topic, this, this relationship with text, text and image. Well, yeah. maybe we'll do another photo book show on that. You did one already, um, but hmm. maybe the relationship of text and image could be another photo book show. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of different different approaches where it complements, contradicts. Mm -hmm. um, Mickey Mickey Mouse is something where you just say uh, the text is just what you see in the image. So there's a lot of lot of stuff to talk about there. Good idea. So now, thank you for thanks for mentioning that. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, it's time to sign off. Grace, did you want to say something? No, I was no. going to say thank okay. you. I was going to, yeah, I was just okay. going to say thank you. This was great. Thank all you. So- right. Thank you all for being here and see you at the next one or at Stefan's AI mini workshop. Don't forget about that. <laughs>